Lisinopril side effects. My name is Dave, I'm a pharmacist, and I love statistics. So the probability of side effects in general, 15.5%, that's roughly one in six patients who take lisinopril will experience one or more side effects. Out of those people, about half of them will stop taking the drug altogether. So that gives you an idea of the tolerability of lisinopril. Now we're talking about the mechanism of action because almost all the side effects that we're going to discuss link back to the mechanism of action logically. So angiotensin 1 is a hormone that is converted to angiotensin 2 by this thing called ACE. What is ACE? It's angiotensin converting enzyme. That is the drug target for lisinopril. So the, the red X depicts the inhibition of ACE. By inhibiting that enzyme, we reduce the production of angiotensin II, and we also reduce the secretion of aldosterone. Let's talk about these two things. Angiotensin II is a potent vasoconstrictor. What does that mean? If you constrict a blood vessel, it's just like if you pinch a hose. The pressure inside goes way up. Also, aldosterone is a mineralocorticoid. That means that it promotes the retention of sodium. You can think of that like salt retention. And that leads to fluid retention. Fluid retention means that the volume of fluid inside the blood vessel is increasing. So that's also putting pressure on the blood vessel. So by reducing these two things, we are ultimately reducing blood pressure, and that's the whole point. Now there is an unintended consequence because kinase resembles exactly, it's identical to ACE. These two enzymes are identical. And when we block kinase, bradykinin builds up. And the consequence of that is that many people develop a dry cough. How many people? Roughly 4%. Your probability of experiencing a dry cough on lisinopril is about 1 in 25. Other common side effects, dizziness, headache, asthenia, and nausea. Now those first two, I think, can be linked back to the mechanism. Dizziness could be a consequence of lowering blood pressure, and headache could be a consequence of a relative blood vessel dilation. So if the blood vessel is normally more constricted, and now we're letting it kind of open up more, that could press on a cranial nociceptor, on a pain receptor in the head, causing a headache. Another big side effect with lisinopril is potassium. This may be the most important thing. Elevated serum potassium, so that's the, the level of potassium in your blood, could go up. It usually goes up very slightly, only 0.1 milliequivalents per liter on average. However, in a very small subset of the population, about 6% of people who take lisinopril with normal kidney function will experience a greater increase in their potassium level. Now the reason I specified with normal kidney function, the number of people who experience that level of an increase uh, will go up if, if kidney function is bad. So even in those who have good kidney function, uh, there's still 6% uh, of them will experience a pretty big jump in their potassium levels. So your doctor needs to monitor your electrolyte levels, your potassium levels. And like I said, almost all the side effects we're talking about today link back to this mechanism of action. Aldosterone, right? We were talking about that. That, that promotes sodium retention. So basically, uh, the kidney is the filter for the blood. It's the filtration system for the bloodstream. And aldosterone basically tells the kidney, hold on to the sodium. Go ahead and get rid of some potassium if you have to. So when we block angiotensin converting enzyme, we are reducing aldosterone secretion. And the ultimate effect of that is less of this signal, less of the signal to the kidney that tells the kidney to retain sodium and get rid of potassium. Uh, ultimately, that means there's a potential to increase potassium levels in the blood. So that's why increased potassium can be a problem with lisinopril. So why do we care about potassium? If you have hyperkalemia, which is a condition of high potassium, that can result in deadly cardiac arrhythmias, okay? Um, it could result in benign cardiac arrhythmias as well, but we're most worried about ventricular arrhythmias, which are potentially deadly. So what is the probability 
of hyperkalemia, uh, about 2.2% of those taking lisinopril for hypertension, for high blood pressure, experience hyperkalemia, and about 4.8% of those taking lisinopril for heart failure experienced hyperkalemia. So generally, those who are taking lisinopril for heart failure, if you have heart failure, you tend to be more frail and I think more prone to side effects. So that could explain the discrepancy between the two groups. Uh, so what are the risk factors for hyperkalemia? Uh, you have renal insufficiency, which is basically poor kidney function. Also diabetes. And then there's three products, three categories of products that increase your risk. And those are potassium sparing diuretics. Examples are spironolactone, eplerinone, triamterene, and amiloride. And then you have potassium supplements like chloricon and KDOR. And those are just two examples. There are others. Um, you may just be taking something that's prescription. It could be called something like potassium chloride, for example. Uh, so those things. And also potassium containing salt substitutes. So if you're taking an ACE inhibitor, you should not be using salt substitutes. Okay, the other side effect very clearly links back to the mechanism of action. We're talking about a drug that decreases blood pressure. So there's always the potential to sort of overcorrect, right? We could decrease it too much and that could lead to hypotension, which means low blood pressure, specifically less than 90 over 60 millimeters of mercury. And what's, what's the big problem there? Well, if it was severely low, you would be worried about getting enough blood to the vital organs. But another problem is syncope, which is like fainting. If you faint, you could do some serious damage to yourself, obviously. So what is the probability of hypotension of low blood pressure? In those who are taking lisinopril alone, and they don't have other complications, the probability is pretty low, about 0.8%. And in those who are taking lisinopril with other medications, like other blood pressure lowering medications, and they have a more complicated picture health-wise, uh, the probability can be as high as 11%. I think it's very important to monitor your blood pressure at home, and I'm not going to talk about that in this video, but I do have a video where I go into great detail on how to pick a really good blood pressure monitor for home use. So what are the risk factors for low blood pressure with lisinopril? Basically, we're looking at things here like volume depletion. So things like excessive fluid loss. And these are four examples of things that would lead to that, right? Excessive perspiration, sweating, uh, dehydration in general. And that could be as a consequence also of taking a diuretic. So something like hydrochlorothiazide or furosemide, for example. Um, vomiting and diarrhea also. So all those things basically are mechanisms by which you can lose uh, large amounts of fluid and that increases your risk of low blood pressure. Also, hypoglycemia has been seen with lisinopril. This is way more common in people who are taking insulin injections, taking oral anti-diabetic agents, and people with impaired kidney function. And generally, the standard of practice there is just to closely monitor for low blood sugar during the first 30 days of ACE inhibitor use. Okay, another big side effect, which is very, very rare, fortunately, is angioedema. So this can be like swelling of the airway, very difficult time breathing, maybe not able to breathe. This requires emergency medical attention. And this is about one in 10,000. So very small risk, 0.01%. So the mechanism of action for that angioedema, by the way, it also links back to bradykinin theoretically. Nobody knows for sure, but the theory is that this bradykinin accumulation could eventually trigger angioedema. But like I said, it's very rare. So what are the risk factors for angioedema? Uh, there are three big ones. If you're African-American, if you smoke cigarettes, or if you're a female, all of those things are risk factors. And there's one common drug interaction I wanted to point out. The drug interaction between ACE inhibitors like lisinopril and NSAIDs. NSAID stands for non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Examples are like ibuprofen and naproxen. So using those things together, that increases the risk of acute kidney failure. So that's not good, and that's more likely to occur in people who are elderly, 
who are volume depleted and those who have impaired kidney function. And that just illustrates the importance of making sure your pharmacist knows when you're taking an over-the-counter medication and also checking with your doctor, just make sure it's okay for you. I have a book out now intended to help people who have received an ablation for atrial fibrillation and wish to do everything they can to minimize their risk of developing a recurrence to the greatest extent possible. And that's available at my website, DaveRx.com. Thank you for tuning in. See you next time.